cut off from the rest of the plant. It's very important for this branch to stay connected to the vine because when it is connected, everything that it needs for its life flows through in a miraculous process. And these little grapes are transformed into something that is nourishing, something that gives life to all of us. I want to tell you a story about a, a family in my former congregation, a mother and daughter, Terry and Becca. Terry had gone to church, and the mother had gone to church, but over the years she had been cut off for one reason or another. She had fallen away from the church, and her branch had, in a sense, it had withered. She, she did not really have a connection to a faith community. But when her daughter, Becca, was born, and started going to school, she became friends with a member of our church, Lindsay. Lindsay loved to sing, and Becca loved to sing. And so Lindsay invited Becca to come to our children's choir to sing, because they loved doing this together. Well, Becca came, and she was just thrilled to be able to sing with a whole group of kids that loved to sing just as much as she did. And she would sing in the choir, and you could just tell that she was blossoming in this, in this setting. And so her mom came to me and said, I'd like Becca to be able to receive First Communion, but she's never been baptized. And so when Becca became old enough for her First Communion, we went through the whole process of educating her about what it means to be baptized, and we, in a sense, grafted her vine, their vine, into the larger vine of our congregation. And I'll never forget when Becca was baptized, now she was older, so it wasn't a baby, but we had a big tub out in the middle of the sanctuary. And she stood on it and she was wearing a white robe. And when she was baptized, we poured the water of her and she put her arms out and her face like this. And you could just see the smile on her face as this water cascaded down her. And then we toweled her off, and she was able to receive her first communion along with the other friends in her class. Terry and Becca became part of the vine of Christ and are still members of that congregation to this day. They are sustained, they are nurtured, they are loved, and they have done great ministry. Becca has gone on to do service projects and sing in the, in the church praise band and has, has gone out on mission trips and, and they both have done wonderful ministry. So they are nurtured and they nurture others. I don't know if you noticed that in the readings today we heard a word repeated many, many times and that word is abide. Did you catch that? Abide, abide, abide. It happened in the reading from 1 John, and it happened in the reading from the Gospel. The Greek word here is menos, M-E-N-O-S, menos. And it has three meanings. One meaning has to do with space. It means to abide in a certain place, to sojourn, to tarry, not to leave a certain place, to be present, to be held and kept continually. When we abide in a congregation, we come to the same place with the same people over and over again, week after week, and being in the same place together is like being on the vine together. Being able to be nurtured, fed, held continually. We abide with each other. Even some of our members who cannot physically be with us, we still abide with them. Our homebound communion people, and myself, we take communion to them. 
so that they know that they are not cut off from the vine simply because they cannot be physically present. But they are, in fact, part of one of these longer branches that they are still connected to us. And I can't tell you how many times I've been to visit our homebound members who express such gratitude for the cards and the visits and the home communion because they feel connected. They still feel part of this place, even though they cannot physically be here. We abide with them, and they abide with us. Being in the same place helps to shape who we are. After so many generations of seeing families come and how this has shaped their faith over the years, you can start to see the tendrils go out and the vine growing. I think of the Baker family with Mel as being the oldest generation, and then his sons and his grandchildren, and, and now we've got two, two little clusters of grapes that are now blossoming and growing in seminary, and we're going to be able to taste of their fruit in the next couple of weeks as we hear them preach. And they are sharing with us the kind of nurturing that we have given to them. They're going to be preaching to us to share what they have learned. They abide with us, and we abide with them. Another aspect of abiding has to do with time. First one had to do with place. Second one had to do with time. And it means to continue to be, not to perish, to last, to endure, to survive, to live. Being a part of a congregation, being part of the body of Christ, is not just a matter of being in the same place. It's being with people over a period of time, sticking with them, no matter what happens. Through thick and thin, it's almost like a marriage, for better or for worse, we stay, we abide with people. The ELCA has a wonderful abiding presence when it goes out and it does re uh, relief work around the world. When we did our hot dog sale uh, for our youth, to fund our youth gathering last week, and we, I was talking with one of the people who gave a donation so that our youth can go to the ELCA youth gathering, and I told him that we're going down to New Orleans to help to rebuild. And he said, wow, yeah, I guess they still have some work to do down there, don't they? I said, absolutely they do. I said, the thing about the ELCA is, long after the cameras have gone, long after the media attention has faded, and there's still need, the people of the Lutheran Church, they're staying for the long haul. They stay over a long period of time. After the tsunami happened over in Asia, after earthquakes happened, the ELCA doesn't just stick around when the limelight's there. They abide with a community of people until they are able to be connected back to what they need to survive. They abide with them over a period of time so that they are not cut off, so they do not wither, so that they can again begin to bear fruit. When we abide with people, we invite them to become part of the body of Christ. If you've been following your email and if you've been following the E100, one of the things that I invited you to do for today is to think of some people that you might invite to be grafted onto the vine of our congregation. One of the things that I've noticed in the time that I've been here is how nurturing and welcoming and loving this congregation is. You know, I've been to, some, I've been to a lot of different congregations, and a lot of congregations will, will say, you know, we're a friendly group, and we, we, we welcome anybody. But sometimes their actions do not uh, match up with their words. And I can honestly say, this is a group of people who will take just about anybody. <laughs> people, when they come to this church, they feel genuinely welcomed and loved. 
And I think of John and Jennifer Schaefer and their little son Dylan. They started coming to our church. And Jennifer shared, I was a little nervous about how, you know, with Dylan being young and, and you know, a little more vocal, how he would be accepted. But I said, you know what? This is a group of people who welcome the little saints of God in church, that welcome those voices, that welcome children getting up and hugging their mom during the sermon <laughs> and, and helping out with the service. This is the kind, kind of congregation that nurtures those little great clusters and wants them on the vine. And I've been so happy with the way their family has been grafted into the vine of our congregation. John helping with the tearing out of the carpet a couple of weeks ago, and Jennifer coming to Bible study. Little by little, they are becoming part of the vine of this congregation. The third aspect of menos, of abiding, has to do with the state or condition of being as one. Being as one. When we invite people into our vine, we're inviting them to become one with us and one with Christ. I want you to think for a minute of the people that you might invite to become part of this caring community. Think of just one person who you might invite to become part of the vine of Christ. And I want you to turn to your neighbor. I haven't made you talk to each other in a long time. You're well overdue. I want you to turn to somebody. I don't want you to just share one person who you might issue an invitation to to become part of the vine of Christ. Ready? Go. Imagine 
Them having the opportunity to learn, to share, to grow, to be generous, to go on mission trips, to do Bible studies, to eat the fabulous food that we have at our different fellowship events. Imagine the joy that that person will feel being bathed in the waters of baptism at this church. When Becca and her mother Terry went through a period of grief, the church was there for them. When their mother and grandmother died, it was the church that gathered around them, gave them meals, gave them a prayer shawl, visited with them, prayed with them. And I'll never forget Terry, the mother, saying to me, I could never have gotten through this without my church family. To be nurtured, to be held, to be loved over the long haul, for better or for worse. People are hungry for that. They are thirsting for that kind of connection. They are thirsting for the fruit of the vine. From little cluster of grapes to the full cluster to the wine that we all share in communion. The person who talked to you today, I want you to pray for them as they are issuing their invitation. And as you come up for communion today and you partake of the wine of Christ, I want you to imagine that person standing next to you and pray for them in good times, in times of tears, so that even if they never say yes, they will be connected, they will be loved, they will be nurtured on the vine of Christ. And we will pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.